Hey, welcome to The Ridge, I'm Chris. I'm the student pastor here and happy 4th of July. If you're joining us in person, hopefully you're planning on sticking around for our cookout. And if you're watching live online and you're in the Columbus area, there's still time to drive right over. Just grab a lawn chair and we'll see you outside with some burgers and dogs. And then students in middle school and high school, tomorrow night, so Monday night, We've got America's Big Birthday Bash right here at the Ridge. We'll have birthday cake, ice cream games, giveaways. So check out all the details in our app. It's a whole weekend of fun around here. If you're new, we especially want to welcome you. You could be anywhere in the world on this holiday weekend, but we're glad that you're here with us. If you do consider yourself new to the Ridge, we'd love for you to text hello to the number on the screen. No, we're not going to sell your information or anything. We just want to get to know you, help you get to know us, and we want to send you a gift just to say thanks for being here. One more thing, if you were here the past few weeks, you heard us talk about the end of our financial year. We just launched a brand new year on July 1st, so we wanted to start the year off by thanking you for how you give through The Ridge. If you'd like to give, you can do that in our app. If you don't have the app, just text APP to 812-408-1188 and we'll send you a link to download it. You can also visit theridge.org slash give if you prefer to give online. But seriously, we really just wanted to say thanks for giving and thanks for being here today.
fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. for singing with us. You guys can have a seat. Happy Fourth of July to all of you. One of the things that I remember on a holiday like today 
is just how grateful I am that we have the freedom and the opportunity to gather together at all, that we can pray together, we can talk about Jesus, we can keep our eyes focused on him. So I don't know if you're in the same place or not, but I'm really incredibly grateful for the freedom that we have in our lives and in our country to be able to gather together in this way. That's my favorite part of Independence Day. My second favorite part of Independence Day is food, which is probably the case that I would say about all of the holidays. That's my favorite part of them. So when it comes to holidays, we do have food kind of attached to them, right? You know, there's the turkey at Thanksgiving, and, you know, and pies and all that type of stuff, Christmas cookies at Christmas. And for 4th of July, I think the thing that comes to mind for me is like picnic food, you know? So we've got actually some hot dogs up here, and we're going to play a game. Vina is up here with me, and we're going to play a game called Legit or Not Legit. And so we're kind of in this series talking about what's real and what's fake about our faith. So we're going to do that with hot dogs. So one of these hot dogs, A or B, one of them is a real hot dog. The other is not. It is a vegan hot dog. And you might say, well, there's no meat in real hot dogs either. Well, this is a beef hot dog. And we are going to play this game legit or not legit. So here are the rules. You can do whatever you want. You can touch it. You can taste it. You can smell it. You can wiggle it, whatever you need to do. Okay. But you have to take a bite out of the one that you think is the legit one, is the real one. Okay. And we've even got like ketchup and mustard. We don't have relish. I'm sorry if you're a relish person. That's I know she's like, I'm, I'm not even going to do it now. I'm not even going to do it now. All right, so which one do you think, you can take your time, you can do what you need to do, or you might know exactly right away, immediately. Do you, do you think you know? Do you think you know which one? I've been eyeing it, so I don't know. Um, one is vegan, though, right? One is vegan. I have never had any vegan stuff. So. Me either. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so, which one do you think, A um, or B? I'm going to go with this. You think that's the real one? Yes. Okay. Why do you think that's the real one? Do you have any idea? I have no idea. Just you, the spirit in you is going, it is that. This looks more burnt, so I'm going to go with this. You're going to go with this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So you take a bite out of that hot dog and or vegan dog. What is it? It's still warm. It is still warm. <laughs> we warmed it up for you. There you go. That is the vegan dog. Yeah, it is. You can tell by her face that it is a vegan dog. All right. So you're, you're not, you're 0 for 1 so far. All right. <laughs> So this one's a little different, but hopefully this tastes a little bit better. Uh-oh. Where'd they go? Here we go. I have right here for you. I'll get them out for you. I've got Oreos for you. One of these is an Oreo, and one of these is a twist and shout cookie. Like a generic kind? Uh, apparently. <laughs> it is a generic Oreo. It is a store brand Oreo. So one of those is not an Oreo, you one of those smart. You is, like scrape. we scraped the name off, we did, <laughs> we did, we're like, it said Oreo on one of them, we're not doing that, and Twist and Shout <laughs> took up the whole cookie, so all right, so we even got milk for you, if you want a Dipsy Doo Dunkaroo in there, you're, you're able to do that, it is, not, it is actually milk, it's not fake milk, it's not Oatly or anything like that, all right, so which do you think is legit or not legit, which the Oreo, which one do you think? I think I'm going to go with this. You think that one is the Oreo? All right, yes. we'll take a bite out of that Oreo or not Oreo. Why do you oh. think that's the Oreo? Why do you think it's the Oreo? It's more scraped. More scraped? Ooh, mm. maybe we tricked you. Mm. All right. Let's see. That is not the Oreo. That is the twist and shout. You're 0 and 2. You're 0 and 2. All right. Okay, well, we got one more. You got one more try here, and this one's a little different too. Okay, here we go. There's this, no way. This is, one of these is cheese. And one of these is not. Is it goat cheese? It is not goat cheese. No, it's just normal old cheese. And one of these is actually chocolate. One of those is oh. cheese. And one of, so now you're like, I'm going to get it wrong on purpose. Okay. <laughs> so one of those is cheese and one of those is chocolate. Which one do you think is the cheese? This is cheese. That's the cheese? We take a bite out of it for me? Yes. All right. It's why, cheese. why do you think? Oh, she's like, I got it. It's thinner than this one. It is thinner. You're right. You're right. That is, that is right. Hey, thanks so much for playing legit or not legit. See, it's hard. We actually got a real, this isn't fake. This is a real gift card to Amazon for you just to Thank say you. thanks for playing. I appreciate it. Give her a round of applause. Thanks so much. So what's the point in playing a game like that? What does that have to do with anything? Well, I think we can find out pretty fast 
that sometimes it's difficult to understand what's real. And sometimes it's difficult to see what's fake. How do you know if something is real? By the way it looks, the way it tastes, the way it smells. We can often tell when something is real, not all the time. Sometimes it's pretty difficult. How do you know if someone is for real? Like somebody in your life. You know, you meet somebody and you want to know, is this person kind? Is this person who they say they are? Do they love me? I mean, how, how can you tell those things in a relationship? What's real and what's not? Is it legit or not legit? How do you know if someone's faith is real? Now, we're continuing our summer series called Legit. And this series is going through the book of James, and it's talking about what does it look like to have real, to have authentic faith that lives out what it means to believe in Jesus, to have a faith that's authentic, faith that's real, not fake, a faith that's legit. And throughout this series, we're really talking about the same thing over and over and over again in a couple of different ways. So the point of the book of James is that he's telling people who follow Jesus just it looks like something in your life. It's not just what you think in your head. It's not just what you believe in your heart. Is that these things should show themselves in our behavior. In the first week, we talked about how James reminds people to follow Jesus, even in the difficult stuff, in the life that can lead us to contentment, perfect and complete, needing nothing. That's a way to show our faith is being content. The second week, Chris Bell, our student pastor, talked about how priorities create movement and how we're prompted to move in our faith. My dad actually came on Father's Day and talked about taming the tongue and how the act of speaking is a huge way our faith actually plays itself out. And last week, we talked about faith in Jesus requires loving your neighbor, no matter what your neighbor looks like, acts like, sounds like. And this week, we're going to start with kind of this principle right here. This is what it is. Faith without deeds is no good. This is just another way to say we're called to have an authentic faith. And James kind of uses this type of language. And one way we know someone has an authentic faith is by what they do. A faith full of knowledge without any action isn't a faith that's alive. So we're going to spend our time in James chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 14. This is what he says. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? The answer is no. Do you ever read the Bible and you think, I, I know the answer to that question? Like, I think he's being obvious on purpose. This is one of the moments. I kind of imagine James saying, like, what good is it? You know the answer to this. You know the answer to this. What good is it? Show it. Can that kind of faith save you? You're like, uh, I think you're looking for no. But he's not even done. This is verse 15. Check this out. This is what he says. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. It does no good. See, faith without deeds does no good. It's dead. It's useless. Let's break this down. James uses this example, and it definitely applies to our lives today. So say you're out and about. You're running errands on a holiday weekend, and somebody you know, somebody you know really well comes up to you. Maybe it's somebody in your family, like your brother, and your brother has no food and no clothing. It's bad. It's a bad situation. And you walk up to him, you recognize him, you walk up to him, you give him a hug, and you say, look, I love you, and I hope you find food. And I hope you find some clothes. See you later, alligator. And then you walk away. And you're shocked when your brother doesn't say, after a while, crocodile. And you're like, what in the world? Why did he not respond that way? The person who's poor and hungry and without clothes needs more than words. Our words are important, but they need to back up who we are and how we behave. See, life is a lot more than just words. They these people in our lives need love. They need help. Somebody who needs food and clothing needs food and clothing. And James is saying, we're in the same boat. 
Do you feel like that? Do you feel like you're the person who needs food and clothing? Maybe, maybe not. But James is saying it like this. Hey, what if Jesus said the same thing to you? What if Jesus came and said, hey, I see you. I see that you need help. I see that you fall short of God's standard, that you sin. I see that you are just in desperate need of a savior. Well, see you later, alligator. And he didn't save you. What if God said, I love you, I created you, but I don't care about you and just never helped us? That's what James is saying. Just like that, if we see people in our lives that need help in any capacity we, and we don't help them, it shows our heart. It shows that our faith isn't quite as alive as we think. Maybe it's even dead. Maybe it's even useless. Does that challenge you? It challenges me. If our faith were alive, we would have done something. Faith without deeds is no good. And then he anticipates the counter argument. Now, this is so good. I love when the Bible does this. Like you're thinking in your head, well, what about, and what about this, and what about that? And just as we're kind of starting the objection, James replies to it. So this is James, beginning of 18. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, What's your argument? You say, wait a second. Hold on. I don't want to enable somebody. They've made really bad decisions in their life. Have you ever heard that? That's that's one real argument. Or as soon as I get my financial world in order, then I'll be able to help other people. Or I do not have time today. Do you not understand how busy I am? I'm off to do something else that's really, really good. I'm going to love my family well. I've got this thing that I don't want to be late for. There are all of these opportunities for us to kind of argue about what we're supposed to do and when we're supposed to do it. You know, I can barely take care of myself. How am I going to interact with somebody else? And I get that. All those things are real things. But here's how James talks about it. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Ooh, he comes after us. Faith without deeds is no good. Our actions speak louder than words. The way that we live our life shows us the faith that we have inside. Listen, believing is good. Believing is the place that we have to start. Understanding what you think about all this faith stuff and this Jesus stuff, that's an awesome place to be. But demons believe Jesus is real. Following Jesus, that's what James is talking about. He's not just talking about what you believe. He's talking about what you do. Living out of faith, that's legit. And we know it's legit because of the way that we behave. He says it over and over and over again in the letter. Here's the point, the big idea. This is what I want to make sure that we kind of understand. True faith does good. So I have a question for you. What good does your faith do? prompt you to do? Do you have an answer to that? Is there good in your life right now that your faith is prompting you to do? And if you don't have an answer to that, I'd encourage you to slow down. Think about why that might be the case. But I think every single person who are hearing the words coming out of my mouth can have an answer to that question. How is God prompting you to do good? Because true faith does good. Now remember, James is saying loving God and loving others, that's kind of the way that our faith should reveal itself. He calls it the royal law. The most important thing we do in our lives is love God and love others. So how do we know we're loving God and loving others? How do we know if we're doing good? By our actions. That's kind of what he says over and over and over again. True faith does good. So are you as intimidated by this as I am? I mean, I get it. This makes sense. We go like, this makes sense, but I mess up. You know, I fall short. I'm not always doing good. Living out faith is difficult. And we start thinking, hey, we have to earn God's love by doing good stuff. Do you ever think that? Like, I have to do good stuff to kind of have a right relationship with him, to be saved. Don't get confused by that. This is an important concept. Listen, Doing good does not equal salvation. Salvation means having that right relationship with God. It means being forgiven. It means being saved. 
You ever heard that term? See, our actions are incredibly important, but they don't save us. We have to say that in the middle of this series. See, Jesus died on the cross for us. And if we surrender our lives to him, that's what saves us. Jesus saves us, not what we do, not what we think, not how we act. James isn't saying the way that you act can save you. He's saying that because you're saved, then you can act a certain way. It should change the way we live because of Jesus. If Jesus really died on the cross, really saved us from where we fall short, it's called sin, really loves us, then we should respond. We should respond by loving God and loving others. So what is God prompting you to do? What good is he prompting you to do? Now, I have four kind of categories that we can think about that in today. Just actually answering the question today in your life, this week in your life, how is God prompting you to do good? All right, here's the first one. You can do good at home. Now, for some reason, I think some of us, we don't always think that this is really where this plays out. You know, our families are a huge deal to God. God gives us family in a lot of different varieties and a lot of different flavors. They all look slightly different. But what does doing good in your family look like? Maybe this looks like slowing down and actually talking to your kid rather than moving on or playing on your phone or saying, please leave me alone. I mean, that's not ever happened in my life. I don't know why that one came to mind for me. I mean, maybe this looks like taking care of an ailing parent, even though it's exhausting. Maybe it looks like just being selfless in the way that you interact with other people in your life. Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's resolving a conflict. I mean, have you ever, here's an example. Have you ever come home, like after a long day, maybe you're at work, maybe you're running errands, whatever, you come home and you're exhausted, and there's like this super clear way that you can do good at, at home. Like it's like, oh, like it's singing to you. It's so clear. That happened to me the other day. Abby had been asking me to clean out the gutters for days, for weeks, for months. And I just didn't want to do it. Like that's not the most fun thing to do. But it needed to be done, and I came home, and I had time, and it was a beautiful day. I'm running out of excuses, and I was tired, and I really didn't want to do it, and I grumbled, and I had an opportunity to do good, to do something right, but with the right motivation and the right heart. I did not do it with the right heart. I did it. Now, is doing chores at home doing good? Yeah, I think so, if your heart is in the right spot. If you're doing things in your home, in your life, in your family, in a way to love other people, in a way to respond to God, you're not being selfish, then yeah, doing good through your chores is a, is a great way. And I'm sorry, kids who are in here who aren't very happy with me right now, like just, you know, staring daggers at me. Like, I get it. But it's about this motivation in our heart. Loving others because Jesus loves you. And the best way to do that is kind of in our home. It's simple, but it's significant. But how else? There are other ways, too. There are a lot of ways. We're just going to talk about these categories. See, true faith does good. Here's another way. We can do good at work. What would it look like for you to love your coworkers like Jesus loves your coworkers? Is it being gracious with somebody's mistake? Maybe it's not complaining about the little things. You know, can you believe that they changed the coffee in the break room? Can you believe that they were late to this Zoom link? I mean, those are real things that people have said. The possibilities are endless to do good at work. These people you see regularly in some context, see, pray for them. Do you pray for the people you work with by name? Talk to them about real things in your life and invest in a relationship. Invite them to church. Talk to them about your faith. Talk to them about Jesus. Those are all ways to do good at work. See, because true faith does good. How's God prompting you? Is he prompting you yet? Well, we'll keep going. Here's the third way. Do good at church. Did you know that there are ways right now, today, that you can put your faith into action at the rich? 
Now, I want to get really practical for a second. There's a QR code that we're going to put up here on the screen, and you can pull out your smartphone. You can take a picture of that QR code, and it will take you to all these different ways to do good at the Ridge. You can also just come and talk to one of us and, and find these ways to do good at the Ridge, but something odd happens at church sometimes. See, we go to church. We attend online. We're in person, whatever. We think about the things, we pray, we sing, we listen kind of sometimes. I mean, I see it, there, there's one or two asleep in here. It's okay. But we don't ever take time to get connected. We don't ever take time to do anything. We consume. What do you think it says if you tell somebody, I believe in Jesus, I follow Jesus, but then you don't have a way to point to that's doing good even in the church that you attend. Look, and this isn't a guilt trip. That's not why I would say that. It's really not. This is me telling you one of the greatest ways to grow in relationship with Jesus is doing good, including doing good at church. It's not just because somebody needs to hold the babies or hold the door open. Those things are true. It's a way to live out your faith. It's a way to respond to the way that Jesus loves you. It helps other people experience that same love. It's a way to be a part of what Jesus is doing in and through the ridge. See, true faith does good. And if you're connected here, if you feel prompted by God right now to do some good, it would be our honor to help you out with that. So you can do good by greeting people who are online walking in the building. You can do good by helping out in our Ridge Kids areas. You can do good by helping with the band or the sound or the lights or the cameras. You can do good by using the things that you're already gifted in doing. You already know how to do it. God's helped you know how to do it. You can do good because true faith does good. So we're going to leave that QR code up on the screen. We're going to talk about the last way that we can kind of do good. Do good in your community. That's the last one. Do good in your community. So our vision at the Ridge is to do whatever it takes to reach our community for Christ. And if we're never uncomfortable, if we're never being stretched outside of what we normally would do, that's not a whatever it takes type of thing. I think it makes complete sense that in your community, your neighborhood, your subdivision, your apartment complex, your local food pantry, your homeless shelter, these neighbors and friends and family and coworkers that you have, that you have this opportunity to live out your faith by doing good right where you are. God has you where you are for a purpose. Do you know what purpose he has you there for? How can you be a part of it? Where is God working in your life? How is he prompting you? So that same QR code on the screen, there's a place for you to indicate interest about helping out at some places in our community and doing good. For example, we have a partnership that's here in Columbus called Love Chapel. They provide all sorts of different needs for people who live down the street from you. We can help through volunteering in simple and clear ways. We can do good. See, the opportunities are endless. There are a lot of ways. We don't have excuses. He's saying no matter where you are, no matter what you do, no matter what you think, no matter how old or young you are, no matter how long you've believed, our response to the way that God loves us through Jesus on the cross is to do good, is to respond, is to love God and love others with everything we've got. So you're prompted to do good at home. What does it look like for you to do good in your home today? To do good at work. What does it look like for you to do good where God has placed you to work? What does it look like for you to do good at church? Not because there are needs, but because this is a way to respond to the way that God loves you. What does it look like for you to do good in your community, get out of a comfort zone, and to love your neighbor just like you would hope your neighbor would love you? Where is God prompting you? Where is he leading you? Where is he asking you to respond? He loves you. He wants what's best for you. He wants you to live out your faith in a way that makes an impact. He loves you so much he sent Jesus and he wants you to respond. He's calling you to take a step. True faith does good. What good is he prompting you to do? I'd like to pray for us. Heavenly Father, 
I'm challenged as we've been reading through uh, the book of James at how practical it is and how difficult it can be to, to live it out. We know, I think, many of us know that doing good is a good thing to do. But there are times that we do struggle. There are times that we make excuses. There are times that we don't want to take a step. There are times that we are so intensely focused on ourselves and our situation that it's hard for us to kind of lift our eyes to what you would have us do. So I ask for your help. I ask for you to speak so clearly through your spirit to every single person here interacting with these words right now that you would show us so clearly what does it look like to do good. Not because you need us to do it. You don't. You want us to do it. You know it helps us grow. You know it helps for other people to see the love and the joy and the peace that comes from a relationship with you. So help us, prompt us, motivate us to do good. And thank you so much for Jesus, the perfect example of doing good, even when it's hard, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it led to death on a cross, that he loves us so much that he would come and do something that no one else would be possible in doing and loves us so fully that we can respond to him, that we can be right in relationship with you because of what he did, which prompts us to respond. We love you. We're challenged by you. We surrender to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray today. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with us?
Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to talk to somebody about your relationship with Jesus, or you're still thinking about what does it look like for you to do good in your life, in your world, at home, wherever, we would love to get in touch with you. You can text the word chat to the number on the screen right now, and we'll follow up with you. I would just be delighted to talk to you too, even before you kind of leave, or if you're online, be sure to comment, and we'll get in touch with you that way as well. Hey, we also want to remind you right now, going on right now, there are hot dogs and hamburgers and things going on outside, so be sure to hang out for a little bit, enjoy some time of community and interacting in that way as we celebrate uh, what God has done through Jesus and the freedom that we have to kind of celebrate that together today. I hope to see you next week. Have a happy fourth.